the next slide then, uh, Moose Lab, if we could just move on one. Sorry, here we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the page that I, I was I was just on. So uh, as I was saying, we review a variety um, of contracts to comply with university policies. Um, in doing so, we have to draft a lot of the uh, contracts when we're the lead uh, in a project. And to do this, we use a variety of templates or precedents as our um, legal services uh, call these. Um, so that we're not having to recreate the wheel every time we, we need a new contract. Although some of the contracts that we do draft um, could be bespoke if we don't have a suitable um, type of contract uh, saved already. Um, we're responsible for storing the documents which uh, can come in uh, certainly for audit requirements. Um, we ensure they're circulated to the academic um so if, if there's any query on there we can answer that or we can deal with any disputes if we um if we need to we can approve or recommend approval in case of, uh, according to university policy so as, as research contract professionals uh, our ability to approve anything is is uh, very low however um if we need to uh, send a contract to the head of research, uh, she will approve it based on us recommending it for approval. She doesn't look at the legal terminology of the contract. She will just accept our word that we, we have done that. Um, we also negotiate with third parties. Um, and this is usually around problematic areas. Um, for example, uh, intellectual property, which we're going to cover a little bit later on. Uh, is a common one, uh, with the aim to reach a point of mutual acceptance. And I guess the thing to say there is sometimes if we can't reach a point of acceptance, we will work with the academic uh, member of staff, but we might just have to say we're, we're not in a position to proceed with this project. And generally in, in the contract world, um, the role can be fully dedicated to contracts or what we quite often see is a small element of contracts will be absorbed into other roles, such as a, a finance role. Um, so it might not be a standalone function. As I've said, this only changed about 14 months ago, Loughborough, so many other universities are um, still at that stage. And the other thing is we, and I noticed um, there were some comments on the forum about, you know, we're not lawyers. Um, and I think most people in my role uh, don't have a formal legal background. So uh, within the team we have, nobody has a law degree, for example. We're not trained solicitors or lawyers. Um, but we do have a legal services team who we refer to if we need uh, any real technical support on contracts. And it is generally uh, said in, you know, certainly within the UK that it can work better if a research contract professional doesn't have a legal background. Okay, so can we just move on a slide, please? Okay, so just talking about contracts at Loughborough. Um, so if we just move on to the, the next screen there. So I guess the first thing with contracts is, is to understand why they're important. Um, the university does place a lot of focus on contracts and I think the main thing is it reduces undue risk and liability. Um, it, at Loughborough we are classed as a charity, we have a charter uh, and we have to apply with a number of laws which uh, will be on the next slide but certainly one of the main laws is um, our obligations under charity law to protect our assets and not place them under undue risk. Um, so by reviewing contracts, and, in, and we will come on to risk later on, um, we can comply with our charter. It also allows everybody to know what's required and what their obligations are. Um, 
puts in place so there is a sort of project management tool that um they can really help us if we put that detail in some of the project plans and appendices there quick one as i've already hinted on it ensures we don't fall foul of the law um, and it also helps us to and um, one of the final topics will be about dispute resolution if things go wrong the contract should allow us to put it correct and, and put it right to the benefit of all parties without going down an expensive legal route. And I guess the final one, which our finance colleagues are particularly keen on, is it ensures we get paid at the end of the day. So, can we just move on a slide, please? So, I mentioned about compliance with law. Um, and this might seem a bit overkill because I've just said that we're not legal trained um, but this just gives you an example of the number of laws that we actually have to consider when we're uh, reviewing a contract um, so I've mentioned charity law and um, tax law is certainly uh, one that we have to pay a lot of consideration to we have data protection freedom of information uh, and there's various other laws with competition law um, we, we need to be aware of uh, and one of the main ones we have at the moment dependent on the nature of the activity will be around export control and um, so there's very strict internal procedures that look for it to ensure we don't fall foul of those types of law and um, so that's what we have to pay particular attention to now i'm not sure how many of those are in common with um, your laws in serbia right suspect quite a lot of them are, are quite common at this point as, as as we've all been governed by European law uh, up until recently for, for us in the UK and our laws haven't actually diverged uh, too dramatically uh, yet. Okay, so next slide please. So I think when dealing with contracts we, we see certain trends that we um, that we we notice um, so from from an issue point of view um, I've mentioned liability and this is one that occurs in the most um, most contracts we see so particularly ones with uh, private sector funders and um, we'll have unlimited liability or certainly liability that's not proportionate to the value of the project so to give you an example of that, I've seen one lately where the project value was £8,000 and the required liability on it was £5 million, which is clearly a little bit out of out of sync there. So we would try to negotiate that to a more acceptable uh, position. We also see a lot of contracts where confidential confidentiality requirements are for really lengthy terms or forever and um, obviously that puts an additional burden on the university to ensure they've got those measures in place to to, to comply with that uh, type of clause and um, so that's one we always try to negotiate down to you know hopefully the five year sort of type of uh, length we're going to cover a bit about governing law, but governing laws being overseas can be very problematic. Um, so particularly with some of our American funders where we have not only the federal law, but we have state law, which can be very different according to where in the United States we are. Um, I mentioned when I was in the breakout room earlier today, um, we do see some contracts that try to restrict publication rights or academic freedom. So um, examples of that could be as simple as a studentship where a company is paying, for example, £50,000 towards a PhD student. The true cost of that could be around the two, 200000 mark and they want to earn all the IP and to have the final say on whether that student can publish which is obviously uh, something that we can't agree to in that um, in that sort of uh, scenario now i put time frames as well so claire's mentioned about the research team where 
they require the 10 days notice. Um, unfortunately, we we do get a lot of contract requests where something, uh, potentially a 100 page document needs to be reviewed in 48 hours. Um, so we, we are developing processes to actually bring those in line with the research office as a, as a whole. Uh, and then finally, we, we see um, a lot of incorrect contract types. Now, following on from this, we're going to have a look at the different types that I get to review. Um, but quite often, for example, we'll see a service contract for a research project and we have to then um, negotiate that to a, an acceptable position as well. Okay, so could we move on uh, one screen, please? So I've touched on this um, briefly. Um, so we were set up in April 2020. So we currently consist of, of two people at my level. There's myself and my colleague, uh, Dean, within the office. And we have just recruited one further member of staff uh, to work at a slightly lower level. Um, and she'll be starting with us in about three weeks time. So we'll have a total of three uh, full time equivalent posts within contracts. And that's to deal with a, around 60 contracts per month, um, which we actually receive in. So one of the first things I had to do within my role was to, to get a measure of how many contracts are we actually dealing with. There was no numbers uh, to, to, um, to base any forecasts or estimates on. And as the final thing there is the research support team leaders still will deal with some of the contracts when we are not in a position to be moving through in a timely fashion. Uh, and we also use temporary staff or locums as, as, as we call them that we bring in uh, on short term contracts. Okay, so next slide please. So contracts can be a little bit laborious and a little bit boring. So. I've put, after each section, I've put a question uh, break in there. So does ever, anybody have any questions on, on kind of what I've covered there so far? Nope. Okay. Ah, so we have a question which says, are, are we all lawyers? <laughs> Um, within my team, we, we have no lawyers at all. Um, so as I've said, within that team of three people, uh, none of those are, are actually legally trained or, or qualified lawyers. We do have a legal services team, which is probably consisted of around six legal, uh, legally trained lawyers and solicitors, and they will deal with Probably the larger contracts, so the framework agreements, we, we get uh, that require a little bit more specialist knowledge. They also deal with a lot of the property contracts. Uh, so if we're building a new building or acquiring a piece of land, they'll, they'll certainly deal with those. And then they also deal with some, some more problematic contracts. So um, contracts such as deeds that we, we, we get um, come in. Uh, and that side of things. So effectively, we're dealing with the easier contracts than the lawyers. Um, and most contracts associated with research projects would fall within that, uh, that sort of category. Okay. So if we could just move on to the next screen, please. So what I thought would be useful would be to to go through the types of contract that we actually receive, um, because I think commonly people think we've got a contract in place. That's that's it, um, which, as we'll see as we go over the next couple of slides, there might be different contracts that we receive for different parts of the project. So if we could just move on one slide, please. 
Okay, and I've can I've tried to do this on a, a project timeline almost. So the first phase is 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 really the initiation phase or the the discussion phase. So we get a number of contacts that um, are either requested or sent to us um, at this stage. The most common one being a, a non-disclosure agreement, NDA as we call them, uh, and this is generally used at the discussion at the bid formation stage. Um, so Claire and her colleagues might come to us at this point and say we need to put some uh, agreement in place because especially if confidential information is being exchanged at that point of view, we, we need to specify how it's going to be used, how long it's going to be retained for um, and exactly what we can use it for. So. What I would say about the non-disclosure agreement is it, it is a legally binding um, contract, unlike the memorandum of understanding, which is underneath. So effectively, this is a, a statement of intent. So this isn't a legally binding document, um, but it will just set out what the relationship is going to look at. Um, between look like between the partners. Now, what I would say on this one is that we we need some very specific wording um, put into a memorandum of understanding to ensure that it isn't a contract, because we get presented with a lot of these things where if we sign them, we are formally committing uh, to a relationship with that that company. Um, so. They're very common when we're dealing with a lot of the uh, universities and companies in Southeast Asia. We see a lot of these type of documents coming, coming through. Uh, if we could just go to the next screen, please. The other document that we get at this um, this point is is what we call a head of terms. So. These can be called letters of intent are, are quite common uh, to see them um, at that point in time. So this basically is a non-legally binding document again, but it's saying if we're successful, um, you know, we agree in principle to continue this relationship and to, to build this project. So those are the three main ones we see really at the, at the start. And then we move on to the award phase. Um, and at this stage, it will be common that we'll see a grant agreement. Um, so I think when this project was successful, that would have gone to go to, to review. Um, and I think generally these set out the terms and conditions of the award. As I was saying in the breakout room, they're not really things we can usually negotiate too much. Um, so at Loughborough, for example, we we have an automatic acceptance of certain things that, in an ideal world, would would look a little bit more problematic. So our research council terms and conditions aren't perfect in our eyes, but because we have no negotiation powers and because we uh, have have a relationship with the funders and it's considered to be stable and, and not problematic. We, we generally just sign those off. Whereas some of the lesser funders, we might have to go back and, and ask for certain things to be included or omitted from, from a grant agreement, which can seem a little bit ungrateful when somebody's funding a project. But again, we have to comply with our laws and comply with our charters. So we, we will negotiate those. And the, at this stage as well, we generally see a collaboration agreement. Um, it could be called a consortium agreement. Um, and this is set out between the different parties that want to cooperate on the, uh, on the uh, project. Now, some of the contracts that we've seen previously, for example, confidentiality agreements, that provision could be in within the collaboration agreement. So the the type of agreement could occur at multiple points throughout the project life cycle. If we could just move on the screen, please. 
Um, we might also see studentship agreements, um, which I've, I've mentioned previously. Um, this is when externally funded uh, students contribute to a part uh, to a project. Um, and the main thing we we include in those is, is to, to ensure that the student is in the position to comply with the academic regulations um, and it sets out that relationship with the external company. And then as we move along throughout the throughout the project, we get a couple of different document types that we see. So one would be an accession agreement. So when we add somebody to an existing agreement, um, it's quite a simple document. They have to accept the terms of the original contract and, and we have to sometimes gain the, the acceptance of all parties to ensure that the new party is, is acceptable to all. And we might get standalone data sharing agreements as well. So this is once again something that would generally be covered in a collaboration agreement, but academics might find some data from a different company that they can bring in and use to, to enhance the project. So we might have to do something bespoke at that, at that point in time. Okay, next slide, please. Um, dependent on the nature of the project, we might have material transfer agreements. Um, so this can be anything, human tissue, anything like that, uh, chemicals. Um, so we, we will generally put in uh, an agreement with that company. We also have innovation agreements quite commonly. So this would be when the principal investigate, for example, moves to a different organization, that grant moves with them. And then we have to then set up a three-way contract with the new uh, organization who, and it basically replaces the one that we've got in place uh, there. Some contracts can be be used, but they are very widely uh, misunderstood. So we get asked to put a lot of subcontracts in place where we uh, put contract the uh, the external person or company on our standard supplier terms. So generally, we only use subcontracts if we expect the um, the, the company or the person to accept flow down terms. So with some of our government funding, we've got a contract with our government and they need to comply with the terms of it. So we've got specific subcontracts in place. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just getting towards the end of the contracts we use. Um, we use variation agreements, and these are probably the most common ones we have. So if certainly we think over the last 14 months, um, just about every project that we have at Loughborough has been impacted by the COVID situation. Deadlines have been pushed back, funding amounts have been changed, deliverables have been changed. So this is what we do when we need to change the terms of the original contract. Um, so they're usually quite simple to do, um, but we do get a lot of them, especially at this point in time. And then the final one we, we, we have is, is, and it falls to, at the closure stage. So um, sometimes we have to do notices of termination. So um, sometimes parties agree that a project's not going anywhere. It's not worth pursuing. Or oh, indeed, as I put there, certainly as money's tight at the moment, um, if the funding streams are withdrawn, the project can't continue, so we just terminate that. Okay, so uh, next screen, please. So that was a whistle stop term, as we call it, a little bit brief, but that's the type of contracts that we, we use. Do you, does anybody have any questions on the different contract types? And I guess, do you, yeah. do you have similar ones in Serbia? Uh, yes, we have, for example, at the university level for the Erasmus Plus, where the yeah. ask is to project like one, one year ahead with the uh, exact uh, activities and exact workload we're going to invest in, in, in our project implementation, person by person. 
and that changes a lot. So you, you can project, but it's going to change. So when they make the, the, the financial, right, when they um, uh, conduct the payments, then we, we do a variation of agreement all the time, changing the activities, connecting to different person, the workload. So it's 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 usual thing we do because a lot of changes in the year. So you can you can plan something, but but it's never going to look like that. Yeah, exactly. And, and what we've we've started to do on some of our contracts, um, and this might not be with our contract with the funder, but where we have collaborators, we've we've tr we've tried to reduce the amount of paperwork that we have to do. So um, so if we've got a collaboration agreement with with ten universities, for example. We don't, if we're changing the amount we're paying to one of the universities, we don't want to have to have that negotiation with all 10. So we, we build in some specific clauses to say that we, we can change this without going out to the consortium as a, to a signature of everybody, if that makes sense. So we've tried to reduce that admin burden on us, um, you know, to especially in view of the numbers that, like you say, you, you've got them, we've got them in the loft. Um, so, yeah, that might, that might help if you can actually build that into some of your contracts as well. Yeah, so, so, so uh, what was the first thing? Was, so we are the faculty and the university is different legal entity. So we make a contract. When you get Erasmus, for example, faculty staff makes a contract with the university. And the first type of contract was really in detail manner, as you said. So the the amount which is going to be allocated to one person, the months which are going to be allocated to one person. Now they just make one contract saying this person is going to work on project. An additional annex is going to be provided before the payment when we allocate all the activities to the person. Now, now it's easier. So they, they changed that because like uh, one or two years ago. Yeah, I think um, it, it's one of the key areas where things can be made more streamlined uh, in contracting. It, it sometimes feels like there's a lot of barriers put up in place and people have a lot of arguments about things when if we, if we just sit around the table and work out an easy way to do it, it can be uh, beneficial. It, it can, and, and Loveborough has you as a support. You know, most of the things we, we deal with. So we, we provide our project management office with the university, the load allocation and, and calculating and everything, the research staff. So it's, it can be a burden. I love finances, but, but it can be a burden. The Gordanek has a question. Sorry, I was taking too long. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I want to ask, uh, have you developed uh, like your own template for the sites? Do they, are they like intellectual property of the market? And, and how you go about it? When somebody approaches you and offers you a contract, do you, do you, uh, how, how do you manage uh, matching your template uh, with the partners? Okay, so so we, we, we have a number of templates and, and those ones are being uh, drafted by a legal services team. So they should be fit for purpose as long as we apply the correct contract to the right uh, activity. Um, now, in the UK, we, we base our contracts. There, there's two different types of contract. One of them is called a, a Lambert Agreement, which is, is something the government developed to make contracting between uh, higher education institutes an easier process. So our templates are roughly based on the, the Lambert Agreements um, with some specific things for Loughborough in there. Uh, the other ones we see in the UK are what we call Brunswick agreements, which are generally a bit shorter. So instead of being 27 pages long, they might only be eight or nine. Um, but you, as well as that, like you mentioned, when a, a company says, we'd like you to sign this, then our initial uh, point of view is, is generally to say, well, can we put in one of our agreements because it will be closer aligned to the activity but sometimes they won't budge in which case we have to review their document to make the necessary changes to it or 
or, or suggest the changes to it. But I think this is quite common. I think um, I went on a training course and it was called the Battle of the Forms. So whether we use our forms or we use your forms, we, we sometimes we can sit and debate it all day, but something we'll give and we'll, we'll if we have to review theirs, We'll, we'll have an initial look and if it's absolutely not fit for purpose, we would push back. But if it's not far off being what we need, we might just make some amendments to it, if, if, if that answers your question, Yoga. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great. Can I just okay. say something, Adam? Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to talk um, very, very briefly about memorandums of understanding. Just because the UK is really different from the rest of the world when it comes to memorandums of understanding. So I, I'm not obviously so familiar with how Serbia is, of other countries that we work with. For them, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding is a really important document that, that signifies a real intention to work together going forward. It's a really big deal and it's a very important document for many organisations and it may well be for your organisation. In the UK, we honestly put no emphasis on memorandums of understanding at all. They're not illegally binding and they're not really a big thing for us at all. So just for awareness, really, if you're working with UK partners, yeah, memorandums of understanding, not, not really something we're that bothered about. So just for information, really, just for awareness, because um, not everyone's always aware of that. I just thought I'd just throw that in there as well, just so you know, really. Yeah, absolutely, Claire, and I've, I have seen them with old stamps on them and elaborate signatures, and then we just say we can't accept them, so <laughs> it can be problematic. Okay, so I think the next section is yours, Claire, so to do a bit about uh, negotiation. Yeah, can we see that? Yeah, awesome. Okay. So obviously Adam's talked about um, the nitty gritty of contracts, the detail and the technical way of doing it. I'm going to talk about the nice bit, the easy bit, <laughs> which is how you go about about negotiating it and, and the types of things you can you can do to make life a bit easier for yourself. Um, I'm also I'm just going to apologize in advance. At some point during this presentation, I will need to duck out for like one minute just to sort something out with my son um, for his schoolwork. But I, it, it won't be for very long. It's the joys of having children at home during COVID. It's great fun. So but he's he's fine but um i will need to just duck out for a moment so um the first part is is why is this important so it comes back to some of what adam talked about with the contract but effective negotiation is important because it can help ensure you get what you need if you go about it in the right way you're much more likely to get what you need out of a contract than if you go really hardball with no um no flexibility you know it can also help preserve your relationships with your partner if you go in with a fairly friendly attitude rather than being quite strict with them. And for me, on these types of projects, it's really important because you're going to be working with these people for the next three years or more, potentially. Um, so those relationships are really important. So you don't want to turn people off right at the beginning by being really rude and and, uh, and contradictory over a contract. So I, th I think that's really important. As Adam mentioned, it's really important for risk management for your organisation. So sometimes it's just genuinely a case that your organisation just can't agree to something. But telling people that is really important so they understand. And also it really helps set the scene for a collaborative partnership. If you guys develop that, that collaboration agreement together and in a collaborative way, it's a really good indication of how you're going to work together in a collaborative way later during the project. So, so that's why I think it's important. So first of all, what is negotiation? So it's where two or more people or parties with differing views come together to try and reach an agreement on a particular issue. And it is persuasive communication or bargaining. And negotiation is about getting the best possible deal in the best possible way for everyone involved. Where it gets complicated 
is where partners come in <laughs> and they just want to get what they want without being pragmatic and practical and thinking about the longer term solution. So I have a quick question, which is uh, in the room that we've got now. So have, what have you negotiated? Have you negotiated a contract or an agreement or any particular terms? And any thoughts about what helped you to be successful when you negotiated it? So um, you can either pop your hand up or, or, or type in the chat. I really don't mind. Miroslav has a question. Miroslav, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what helped me? For example, uh, we developed the application, but we weren't the lead. So we were, we were looking for a coordinator. And what helped me, to be honest, at a start, how it's going to function. So no, no hidden things. Mm -hmm. So, so honesty, I think it's, it's, and and in uh, along the way, it's, it's really important. Yeah. For everything to, 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 to so to be honest. It starts. Yeah. Yes, go, go. <laughs> uh, I think that we've uh, we've had the loveliest experience negotiating the, the uh, consortium agreement with you and other partners in Extreme Clean Twin. And that was a smooth process, I guess. Uh, uh, and But then, uh, on the other hand, I had some negotiations uh, uh, with other uh, Horizon 2020 projects where uh, I witnessed not, not so smooth uh, negotiation process. Um, uh, we, we are uh, academia and it's easier for us, but when the companies are uh, uh, playing the game, then mm -hmm. it can get really, really tough. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we haven't uh, had such uh, unpleasant experiences so far. I mean, whatever uh, we wanted to change, it was welcomed and changed. But I guess it's uh, rough when you play the game with industry partners. Absolutely. I, I had one example where um, when I was working at another university, it just got so awful that we ended up just walking away because it, it was ju it just got far too complicated. And they, they were just, very, yeah, industry, very demanding and had, were not willing to negotiate on anything, basically. So we ended up walking away from that agreement. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyone else want to add anything? Miroslav, go ahead. Just a quick one also, it's, it's uh, to, to, to get informed about your partners. For example, in the UK, mm -hmm. I know you have a strict procedures, which might take time for, for some partner to issue a mandate. It's one day process. And for you, it's not a one day process. So, so you need to keep in, get informed mm -hmm. about the, the, the partners. What are the yeah. rules of the game? So. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, great. That was really helpful. Um, so is there anything in the chat? Sorry, I can't see it. No, okay. No, we're good. Okay, great. So negotiation skills. So these are qualities that allow two or more parties to actually reach a compromise on a particular point. And these are often what we describe as soft skills. So they're not technical skills that you would have. They're kind of more people-y type skills, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, and they include, include abilities such as communication, um, which I feel is very, very important in this situation. That's probably how uh, Marislav knew that um, UK partners take a really long time to, to get things processed because of the process we have in place. So communication is really, really important. And um, persuasion and persuasiveness skills are great. Um, planning as well. So how long are these things going to take? And just kind of planning out time scales is really helpful. Um, strategizing. So understanding what you and your organization need to get out of the agreement. So you can go in with a bit of a strategy about what you what you want to walk away with and cooperating and understanding those sets of skills and how you can apply them in this particular situation is the first step to becoming a stronger negotiator when it comes to contracts. And the skills you'll need will depend on your environment, your intended outcome and the parties involved. So, for example, Adam often is can be quite ruthless when it comes to his contract negotiation. 
because it's not his relationship with the other party that's on the line it's the academics relationship with the other party so we often say to an academic you can just blame us we can be the bad guy in this situation so that we don't cause any issues with the working relationship for that academic with who they work with if that makes sense so we do sometimes do that which which it is frustrating for us, <laughs> but it really helps the the organisation's relationships with with the other party um, because it's it's just us that are causing the problem. So we've got a few. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when, when when I am ruthless, as as, as Claire puts it, um, so we have had situations where other universities have just been that problematic to 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 work with and. We've had other pressing deadlines, for example, so we've had to get an agreement in place to comply with funder requirements. And we've had to effectively remove partners from projects before. But what I would just add to what Claire was saying is we'd, we'd never take that step without consulting with the academic because it's the academic's pro project. Can it still go ahead without that partner? What sort of approach do we need to, to take with it? So. Um, yeah, I'm not always as ruthless as Claire possibly makes out. There will be some behind the scenes dialogue. Absolutely, it's a process, and it, you know, you want to wait till the absolute end of trying everything else before you go down that route of kicking people off agreements. Definitely, don't do that the first conversation. That's not a good way to go. Um, okay, so some key negotiation skills that apply is. Um, Communication. So communication is really, really important. Um, if you are coordinating a collaboration agreement or what, or a consortium agreement, whatever it might be, the most important thing is communication and clarity. So when do you need stuff back by? Who understanding who needs to do it? So communicate with your partners and understand their situation. If you talk to them they will be able to um, deal with that situation or tell you why it's problematic. And I will just be one second while I sort my son out and then I'll be right back. So just, just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. It's, it's no, no problem, Claire, it's fine. But Adam, I, I, can, I can share something with you. I don't know if it's maybe in your presentation. When I went to, to a negotiation workshop during my fellowship, uh, we were uh, clearly uh, taught that we need to have something that is called bad stuff, yeah. like best alternative to a negotiated solution. And that, that was that was that was something that really like nailed into my mind. And I guess I will never forget that. I just wanted to share. Yeah, I think um, I went on in the UK we have a course called um, Praxis Oral Research Contracts. And there was a very good negotiation model on that, that course as well which um, I think certainly sometimes you think back to uh, when you're actually dealing with a live negotiation. So to come back to uh, what you were saying about the agreement for this project, I also found that to be a very nice, nurtured, easy agreement. You know, we, we, we didn't argue about anything. Um, but as part of the negotiation module that I did, there was um, a book that was recommended, which Perhaps afterwards, I'll, 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 I'll maybe uh, adapt the slides and put a recommended reading on there or something and, and put that book on there because it was really useful, actually, about negotiation. Brilliant. Thank you. Claire, back to you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, um, so communication. Where was I? Yeah, so communicating with your partners is, is really, really important. Um, and also communicating over... Um, key parts and the way you communicate as well so it doesn't always have to be by email I think we over rely on email for these situations sometimes because we want to get everything in writing um, and I think I'll come on to this later but sometimes it's actually better to talk and have a meeting like this and actually chat something through because then you can explain your side and your situation much better it verbally than you then you can by writing it down um, so that's the big thing about communication the next one is powers of persuasion. <laughs> and this takes practice, in my opinion. But if you feel very strongly about why you're correct when it comes to negotiation around a particular clause, and, you, and you've got a really strong argument as to why, um, 
you you can you can present that in such a way that it is very persuasive um it's it's about the way you talk about it and justifying why that clause should be a particular way so those persuasiveness skills can be really really useful when it comes to this and sometimes it's a case of practicing them um so i always recommend practicing them with your family <laughs> and your partners and your children and persuading them to do things um, and that's a good way to kind of start building up those skills so that you can implement them in work work scenarios as well um, planning. So this is comes back to the timescales thing. So I think with EU ones, they're quite strict timescales in terms of getting these things signed off, which can be a bit tricky. So have that plan in your head. So, OK, if it's due, if the EU needs this agreement in six weeks, we probably want to aim to have everyone signed it in four weeks. So we've got a bit of contingency there because some universities typically can be quite slow with these things. So we're probably going to want comments back on a first draft within a couple of weeks so that we've got time to process it. So it's just thinking about that when you send it out and, and being it links back to the communication as well, enabling your partners to plan as well, because then they know when things are due and when your expectations are for them. So, so that's very important as well. And strategy, as I mentioned before, so you're going in with an aim and a strategy. And if you go in with that and you've thought about it beforehand, it's much easier for you to put your point across and explain why you need it. That supports the persuasiveness aspect, which I talked about earlier. It's much easier to do that than going in, not really thinking about it and then ending up just agreeing to everything the other party wants because you've not really thought about a strategy as to how you want to go about it. So um, it's just spending that time preparing and thinking about that strategy before the negotiations even start, really. So that's that one. And then I, I found this really cool picture of a really old telephone because, you know, it's just great old telephones, aren't they, really? Um, it's really important to get what you've agreed in writing because that's how you back yourself up later. But, 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 as I say, sometimes just pick up the phone and have that conversation first so you can understand the other party's point of view, discuss a potential compromise, then confirm it in writing and then email after that conversation so, so that everyone's just on the same page and you, you've got it all straight. So that, that's a really strong bit of advice for me. And it's hard because we're all really busy and it's a time consuming thing to do. But in terms of preserving your relationship, it, it's important, I think. So some other bits, um, be empathetic. So consider the other party's point of view. It might be they genuinely can't agree to something and you then you just need to kind of figure out a way forward. So don't don't be, I use the word ruthless again, don't be completely ruthless right at the start because sometimes you just, do just need to be empathetic to their situation. Like when Adam tells me he has a big backload of contracts when I'm bugging him to get a contract done. You know, you just, you have to be empathetic with that situation. Um, be very clear on what those red lines are and what you can and can't agree to and make those clear. So if you genuinely can't commit to unlimited liability like we can't, you just have to be really open about that from the start. And it's never an option then. You can't ever have it in the contract. So it, it's just being very clear what you can and can't do within your own boundaries. Recognise where you are able to make decisions around contracts and where you can't. So some things you'll be able to decide and some things you won't. So I've got an example of that recently. Um, we've, we've got a complicated contract with somebody. And um, sorry, just one second. What do you need? Okay. Sorry. Um, yes, we have a complicated contract with another organisation and a part of the contract research activity and a part of it's actually them developing some course material for us. So we've actually agreed that instead of it sitting under one contract, we're actually going to do two separate agreements because the work is so, so different that it's much more straightforward to do that. That's a decision I can make. But what I can't do is agree the liability on those because I don't have that. I don't have that responsibility so I then have to escalate that to the appropriate people so it's just recognizing what you can and can't make decisions about 
And also, it's really helpful to identify where it would be useful to involve another colleague in meetings or discussions. So if you are going to be ringing somebody to discuss liability, and you know you can't agree to anything because you would need to get permission, it's much more useful to have somebody in that meeting who can make a decision and agree to something then have a meeting and then afterwards discuss it with the person who needs to make the agreement about the liability and then go back to the other person and actually they can't agree with what that person wants so it's far far better to just have that individual in, in the discussion in the first place rather than risking miscommunication between different people and it's also really important to be willing to compromise where there is a real need to Adam and I use the word pragmatic a lot. So we've got a very practical view of the world when it comes to contracts, which actually I think our lack of legal training really helps with in a way. What do you reckon, Adam? I, th I think that that's very true. So I, I guess my personal feeling is sometimes with when we have the two legal or contract departments talking to each other, it, it's almost as if we we get little words changed and it still means it means the same. So it it can feel almost as if the your the the, the person in the other company is just suggesting change to almost justify their position, uh, if that makes sense. So so long as the contract reads okay in essence to me, it. If I thought, well, that word would be slightly better than that one, I wouldn't make an issue of it because it's just prolonging that process and the academics are both waiting to, to get on with the activity. So as, as, as Claire was saying, we, we do use pragmatic quite a lot. So and that's certainly the approach that I go down and also try and get my team to go down as well. Um, we can all pick holes in contracts, but at the end of the day, especially between universities, there's very little fallout down the line. There's that, and we will cover some of the mediation and dispute resolution, but the chances of a contract be between certainly two UK universities getting to court is pretty negligible. So it's just about managing that risk and understanding the risk of whatever it is you're agreeing to. Um, and yeah, just being practical with it really, you know, because at the end of the day, you want the research to go ahead and just being pernickety over contracts isn't a helpful thing sometimes. So it's very much a balance in my opinion. Uh, so um, I'll just put this out there. Is anyone currently going through a particular situation that they would just like to kind of maybe chat about? It's, you know, again, these things stay within within the group that are attending the workshop, so we won't be kind of shouting about it elsewhere. Um, or um, an example of one you've gone through recently and sort of how you went about it. If not, I'm sure Adam's probably got one he can share. <laughs> I think the only thing I'd really add is, is if possible, and uh, so quite often with contracts, we'll use the track change function within Microsoft Word. So I've talked a couple of times about, um, you know, compliance with charity law and that sort of thing. So rather than just striking a clause out and and, and leaving it at that, I would generally put a comment on saying, you know, due to the sector that we work in um, and due to our requirement to comply with these either the funder terms or the legal terms. So I give that background about why we can't agree to a clause rather than just crossing it out or putting we can't agree to this. So at least then that person understands why you are putting that red line in, in place, if that makes sense. Thanks, Adam. Anyone else? Speciality, um, I guess. So I just thought I'd add that. Thanks, Adam. 
Okay, so um, I've just got some top tips. I'm a big fan of 10 top tips or nine in this particular situation. Takeaways from, from this afternoon so far, um, knowing what your final goal is, so you've got something to aim for. Practice, 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 practice building that rapport and talking to people and practice those persuasiveness skills and the and the justifying why you need something to be a certain way. Um, be willing to compromise where, where necessary, um, like reducing your share to 25%, for example. Um, consider imposing time restrictions to, to get what you need by when you need it. Um, exercise confidence you know if you come across like you don't know what you're talking about people tend to take advantage of that whereas if you come across in a very confident way even if you're like really nervous inside about negotiating something if you come across in a confident way nobody knows that you're nervous or um worried about getting it wrong you know you just have to come across and present yourself in a confident way um, don't take no personally. No negotiations are an attack on you as a person. They're an organisational thing. And it's it's not about you. It's not about the way you've gone about it. Just sometimes stuff just doesn't doesn't happen. Figure out where you're weaker and maybe you need to make improvements. So I guess that just comes from actually doing it and figuring out what you're good at and what you're not so good at. And uh, coming back to just practice, practice, practice. I'm sure Adam will practice with anyone there <laughs> that wants to. Um, and if practicing this type of thing is something that people are interested in for future workshops, let us know. Because I'm sure Adam and I can come up with some scenarios where we could practice some negotiations if that if that would be a useful, useful thing for people. Okay. I think no, um, Claire. The, the only other thing I'd add would be. So even though I work in a, a contract team, there are still things come across my desk where I have to run it by a colleague and check that I'm reading it correct and check that I'm not being unreasonable um, and see how they would go about things. So quite often within the contract function at Luff, where we, we generally bounce ideas off each other and with Claire and her team as well. Um, so I think it's it, it's it, practice is good but also just having that input from a colleague there yeah, i'd agree with that absolutely thanks adam uh so that's it for me so does anyone here it is coffee break we have any coffee yeah. break <laughs> we just add that to the next screen so yeah um as, as, as we said earlier there were there were a few um, areas on the quiz that people felt were less understood. Um, so I think the three that Claire and I picked out were intellectual property, then there was um, dispute resolution and liability. So um, I apologise that it is late on a Friday and we all have um, a glass of beer or wine planned, but um, if we go through this, so some of it I'll go through fairly briefly. Um, because I've put some sort of definitions on here, so I don't think it's necessarily a good thing to to read through those in their entirety to, to your book, to try and relate it to how it feeds into contracts. So could you just move to the next screen, please? So as I said, I've just put some definitions on here about what is intellectual property. Um, and this will vary, I guess, for whichever school's working on something. So um, in manufacturing and, and design, it can look very different to social science, for example. Um, so the first definition kind of covers a lot of, uh, of that. And then we go on to the different types of intellectual property. So this is really for your reference as well. Um, I think there's six different types that we, we cover. And once again, this is something where we would generally refer to our commercialization team for, for advice, but those um, types, just to list them, would be uh, copyright, would be a patent, we then have trademarks, industrial designs, geographic indications and trade secrets. So 
Um, if you just go a couple of screens ahead, Miss Lafitte, that's okay. Yeah, uh, so next screen after that, yeah. So there are the other um, key ones. So if we just go to the next screen, please. And again, this, this is here for your reference. So this this just spells out how, how we would um, protect certain types of IP, um, what method of, of protection we would use. Again, this is something we would refer to the the experts about if it, if it came up in real life. Um, so I'll just leave that in there for reference. Um, could you move to the next slide, please? I think this, this is possibly a little bit more useful because this goes through the life cycle, but also we can relate some of this to the, the key clauses within the contracts that we see. Um, so as I've said, a contract should spell out exactly what needs to happen within a within, within a project. Um, and one of those key things is the project plan and deliverables. So uh, this would be what's envisaged to happen over the project. And in an ideal world, there'd be a, a sort of um, awareness of what IP might actually stem from a project. Uh, so, so that project plan would be quite crucial uh, in any type of contract. We also then cover the ownership, which is, is key in, in intellectual property. So not only the ownership itself, but also the licensing arrangements, which uh, we'll come on to a couple of examples of. Um, and then further to that, we would generally expect to see exploitation rights um, within there. So who can commercialize, what sums are due, is there a revenue sharing arrangement? Um, and, and these things will generally cover not only the results of the project, but there may be potentially background IP that needs to feed into that. So certainly in the desk of agreement, we set out what background IP each party will be bringing in, although that can change as the project um, progresses. We would also have publication, which would have an impact on IP. So um, as we know, we are here to publish. Um, an ideal contract will generally have review arrangements. So if we're working collaboratively, one party doesn't necessarily forge ahead and publish something that may use the background or foreground IP of one of the different parties. So we generally have a the arrangements for these things to be reviewed and also notice periods. So um, quite often that will be 30 days or 60 days um, for the other party to review the arrangements and check that they're happy on that. Um, if a contract's silent, then there's no obligation for that party to act within a, a time frame, uh, so they can effectively drag it out for, for the foreseeable. Um, and the other, the other um, key section would be the project management uh, section. So uh, in the case of the agreement that uh, GoGo drafted for this project, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on project management about how often the board meets and, and what can be discussed there. Um, so certainly any IP issues or, or, or plans could be, could be flagged in that sector there. Um, as I've put, it's not a standalone thing for the uh, contract manager or contract professional there. These things will generally involve more specialist teams, um, especially when you get to the uh, commercialization stage or monetizing stage as it, as it is on this diagram. Uh, they will deal with a lot of the agreements that need to be put in place at that time um, to ensure everything's uh, fully in place and legal. Okay, can you move to the next slide, please? So as we've had some discussions, um, we've had discussions about working with industry, um, and this slide here gives a good example of who we might be working with. Um, so there'll be the university, other research organizations, or, or 
um, government organisations. We also then work with small and medium enterprises uh, and, and with the larger industrial players uh, within a collaboration. So I think the the key thing to understand is everything, everybody here is bringing something to the project. They, they wouldn't be on it otherwise. Um, so they're all adding value to the project, um, but they may have very different mindsets and interests. So, uh, for example, Loughborough is a, a, a charity governed by charter, but some of the other companies may have shareholder obligations. They may feel uh, they're being more ethical to their shareholders to try to, to own all the intellectual property, for example. Um, so in this case, it's, it's, it's very useful if a company is being problematic, and this sort of goes back to some of what Claire was saying, uh, in the negotiation thing, but if we can set a red line that the funder has got this expectation for how the IP is going to use or be owned, it makes that negotiation very easier. And, and in an ideal world, these terms and conditions would be studied in advance of the bid being submitted, but we do see cases where uh, they haven't been. And I've actually put there some, some, some of the IP rules um, that the Horizon 2020 program set out um, that actually shows those obligations and, and those are just something to fall back on if we if we get into difficult um, negotiations at the IP stage. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So earlier I, I talked about um, licensing. So um, these things should all be set out clearly in an agreement as well, and it should be uh, fairly easy to, to understand. But we break this down into background and foreground. So background IP uh, already being your property as you go into a project. Um, and it's very common to see that this is actually just licensed royalty free for the uh, purpose of completing the project in the same way as foreground is. We have a collaboration agreement and everybody shares ideas, information, um, IP, etc. as part of that project. But then it becomes slightly different when we get to the use of the results. Um, so the results that one party generates may rely on those, uh, the background of another, um, of another partner or um, you know, there, there, there may be different obligations for the the results of, of, of the project. So what we quite often see here is that we'll see within a contract that it will be unfair and reasonable conditions um, to be able to use that. So that would be some sort of, for example, a revenue sharing um, agreement. We generally have royalty free for academic and teaching purposes, but as I say, in the case of commercialisation, there should be a fair and reasonable term in there, which can then be interpreted by a court or a, an arbitrator in the case of a, a dispute. OK, so next slide, please. So some of those exploitation um, routes I've, I've listed here as well, um, which Primarily, a lot of it will be the first option, so but the, the use of further research. But then, as Claire mentioned previously, it might be setting up a spin-off company. Um, it may be to undertake further projects. It may just be to register it for the commercialization activity. So those are a few of the options there um, that we might, we might use going forward. OK, next slide, please. So I think this is the key thing that we keep coming back to here. Um, so the obligation to publish is absolutely vital. So we're, in the UK, we call it academic freedom. Um, so we would never usually allow our academics to do pieces of work for the university that didn't allow academic freedom. Um, so as I put there, the, the contract should cover all of the 
how we notify each other, how we uh, about publication, how we allow time for objection. Um, there may be some contracts that we see that specify where the pub publication should happen, should it be open access. Um, as, I, as I go back a couple of slides, the H2020 is quite specific in how we have to in how we have to publish. Um, sometimes contracts will allow for the protection of IP before publication. Uh, the reason being, once it's in the public domain, anybody could actually uh, do with it what they like at that point. Um, again, the rights of a student. If there's a student working on the project, we wouldn't wish to have, for example, a publication clause that allowed a company to, to reject publication and then not being able to actually submit the thesis. Um, at Loughborough, we do have options in place where if there is sensitive information, we can either remove that or if it's impossible to do so, we, we place it in a restricted access uh, sort of scenario within our, our library. And then there is a slight spelling mistake there that should say may list the dissemination activities to avoid disagreement between the parties. So this is best spelled out as soon as we can so that everybody's on the same, uh, same page there. Okay, next screen please. I've put in a little bit here about joint IP. So this is something we we see quite often in in um, collaboration agreements. And I've put an example clause in there, which is is from our own um, collaboration agreement at Loughborough. But I think the the key points here is that we would usually try to avoid joint ownership. Um, because it is a very difficult process to manage and it's not really used much within the uh, sector in the UK, although it is almost covered in every contract that we see just as a just in case, but we would we would usually try to have bespoke work packages that meant the IP naturally sat with one of the collaborators rather than the other. So if I put once again there, the IP model that we, we use within any contract needs to reflect the flow down terms of the funder. And also we quite often get industrial partners wanting to uh, own IP. If it's a publicly funded project, then assigning that ownership for below market value can breach our state aid regulations. So we, we do have a project where we're looking at um, clean cooking in sub-Saharan Africa. An example there could be a large electrical company wanting to develop um, a, a battery to allow solar cooking, um, which is fine if it stays in the African sector only and is large enough that it can't be portable, but if it could then be bought to the UK and used as part of some sort of mountaineering cooking stove, then it, it can potentially be problematic if they own the IP. So we always have to bear in mind those state aid regulations, which I think you have in uh, Serbia as well as, as the UK. So next slide, please. Um, I put once again about industrial partners there. Um, these, they're the most common ones wanting to own IP. Um, and again, it comes back to that negotiation. So it's it's about explaining that the, our research is for the public good. We can't just assign ownership. Um, sorry, the, if they are insistent on owning the IP, we do have what we call Loughborough University Enterprises Limited. So that's a side of our operation that can use a different costing and pricing model and the different approvals. So we would class that more as commercial research that it would cost more, but it is an option for them there if, if they need to. And that takes us outside our charity law obligations there. And I've, I've put a final point there. Um, 
and and we've talked already about legal departments and contract professionals having these debates and negotiating for negotiating sake. So sometimes we do see this about in in the sort of commercially exploitable IP section. So particularly with a lot of our social sciences projects, things like that, that are looking at refugee crises. It, it's important to understand that if, is there a likelihood that any of this is going to be commercially exploited? Because if not, why are we arguing about it? Um, so it's about having that pragmatic approach about speaking to the academic member of staff uh, and working out exactly what's going on on the project and how we need um, to to bear with the contract according to that. So next slide, please. So that's a very quick little whistle top stop to, to of, um, of IP. It is a very complicated subject. Um, and I suppose if, if, if we need further, so Claire's uh, mentioned previously, if we need to revisit any topics we could potentially do that and I could potentially get one of our commercial team to to maybe speak as well. But from that short sort of uh, session, have we got any questions regarding IP? Okay, so I think we're good. So, um, wary of the time if we just move on to the next slide please so uh, i've mentioned previously about um dispute resolution so um this is covered in most contracts i would suggest and it should be covered in all of them if we can just move to the next slide So there's two things we cover um, with dispute resolution. One is dispute resolution itself, and the other is governing law and jurisdiction. So I think this is particularly important because projects do sometimes go wrong. Um, so if we took this project, for example, if, if, if Gog had put in all this effort arranging these sessions and then Claire and I had just not been bothered to write any material or, or turn up, it would be a pro problem. And sometimes we do get partners that do that. So it's hopefully not required, but what happens if things do go wrong? Um, so with dispute resolution, uh, the location is key um, and also the method. So hopefully this avoids any sort of costly court proceedings um, if, if, we can, if we can do that, if there's anything unresolvable on the project. Um, so the main ones is uh, sort of negotiation, mediation, expert determination and arbitration. In the Horizon 2020 program, it will have mediation and arbitration as, as the two options. Um, there's usually clauses here that say senior members of staff might um, get together and try and resolve it to save this process. Um, but the main thing is to, to consider those time scales, who's going to have to defend each thing and, and make sure that once again, the mechanism is proportionate to the agreement. So if we were doing a very small project with an American company, would we want to fly senior members of staff over to defend a court case in, in the US, uh, for example? Because in that case, we may have to hire local legal experts um, because their laws are dramatically different to ours. So, um, as I mentioned, the states, we we quite often experience issues with US funders. Um, if we, we quite often need to refer to our legal services uh, team when we, we get these types of contracts. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same with yourselves, but within the US, there's very different state law. So Californian law is as different to ours as it can be. 
um, that of the state of New York is more closely aligned to, to UK law, so we can negotiate either a, a more suitable state with the US funder uh, that meets in the middle, or sometimes we go to um, neutral territories. Um, so when we're doing contracts maybe with a Chinese company, that could involve uh, having any dispute um, heard in Singapore, for example. Uh, is, is one that we would favour. And the other the other thing is, and, and it's about explaining things sometimes as well. Um, so in the UK, some of our insurance policies don't include certain types of arbitration, for example. Um, so we would then, through that negotiation, try to change it to something which is, is more suitable in our eyes. Uh, there, otherwise, there could be issues uh, down the line. And the other thing is to, to be aware of entering agreements where the law is that dramatically different. So uh, some of the Middle Eastern law we find very difficult to uh, to sign up to. Um, I think we've had a couple of cases with law of Saudi Arabia, which can be problematic with us. Um, but in general, and I think it'll be on the next slide, so if we could just move to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, as I've put here, generally these type of agreements uh, between us, so on, on H2020 projects, are the governing law of Belgium. Um, even though different governing laws <coughs> is something for escalation at Loughborough, we just sign off on Belgian law because we get that many of these. And again, it's it's almost um, non-negotiable. And then I put the different ones within the DESCO agreement that we 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 are offered. Uh, so you've got mediation followed by uh, arbitration, mediation followed by court, or arbitration are the, the common ones there, or they can be varied. Um, depend on how everybody feels about these things, so you could have additional steps within there. Okay, so next slide, please. So that's a very quick version of dispute resolution. So um, I, I'm aware that we are whizzing through these, as it were, but does anybody have any questions on, on, on dispute resolution? Uh, Adam, have you have you ever had a case of uh, actually applying the white rules or dispute arbitration? I, I I simply have no idea what it looks like to go through the the white um, so, so sorry, was that have we ever had a case that we've actually referred to arbitration? Exactly. Yeah. Did, did you did you go through the process uh, with the law for university or before? I, I think we, I, I'm not aware of any that we've sent to arbitration. I think um, be, because the the insurance element, um, so there may have been issues with projects, but sometimes if your insurance policy is not going to cover it and it's a low value contract, it, it's kind of easier just to write it off if, if, if that makes sense. So I know that we, we have had, situations where things have ended up in court with other universities um, but in general it is it's very rare so i think the key thing really is to set out a, an informal step so in the uk and it might be the the case in serbia but in the uk it will generally have people will uh, flag these issues with people of a director level and they'll have 14 or 28 days to resolve this. Um, so we find in general that that step will get rid of the problem in most cases. So um, if somebody's being non-responsive and a director then gets in touch with that academic member of staff, generally things start to move 
a bit more. So even if we can't resolve it at that point, they'll come up with a plan that it's going to be resolved within a reasonable time frame and there isn't an impact on the funding. So I think to, to answer your question, it, it, it's very few and far between. Um, I think if if I was underperforming and, and the director of, of, uh, of research got in touch with me and said, can you get this one sorted out? And then generally I drop everything to do that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, it, it's, it's all about avoiding, you know, because because we uh, in one of the groups this morning, we were talking about contracts and when we're contracting with industrial partners. And if we send a contract to an industrial partner, generally it's going to be about three or four thousand euros for their legal team to, to look at it. That's the true cost of involving solicitors and lawyers. So it's we want to avoid that in a big legal case if we can and there's also the once it gets into the court system there's is there reputational reputational damage and that sort of thing um happening as well so we want to do everything we can just to get around the table and sort it out yeah well we're most afraid of is always is financial pressure and uh, 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 how much <laughs> Cost university, or I don't know, it's not only about good discussions, I could see, or a good, good name, but it's also about financial that we are like, afraid of. Yeah. And cost I think the, you, the, the, the next section, so the financial liability, um, I think that's a key one as well. So I think that the, the key thing for me is we don't treat dispute resolution purely as a standalone clause it links into other clauses so if we can be sued for damage and it's a low value project then so long as we've got the correct liability in place then the impact shouldn't be too great but it's where these these clauses don't line up and, and interact with each other i think is the the key thing that Thanks. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, liability, here we are. Uh, next slide, please. So I think the, there's a definition there. So what is financial liability? And it's basically what we're going to have to pay for somebody else's loss or damages. Um, and th these things can be astronomic. Um, and they can also be fairly, so nobody gets too, too concerned about them. Um, but we generally try to limit, in every contract that we, we process, we try to limit liability. Um, so there's a couple of ways we can do this. So, so one is to exclude liability for certain costs. So in the case of the DESCO agreement, indirect, consequential loss, loss of profit, loss of revenue. These are things where people can almost inflate what the true impact is of a, of a breach. Um, so we would normally, uh, all indirect costs, we would, we would try to exclude anyway. And that is a standard clause within the DESCO agreement. Um, we then see that the DESCO agreement so it's quite similar to the ones we use in the UK. Um, so I think you've got a couple of options on there. So do we limit the liability to the size of the, uh, the award that we're receiving or twice that award? So the, whichever option is generally fairly acceptable to Loughborough uh, in that case, even if it's double the project value, we would not have a massive issue with that. Uh, obviously, the larger the project, the larger that impact would be. If it's a £5 million pound project, then we get... ...and move towards our public insurance, we accept any of those. We can move to the next slide, please. 
But the, the other thing, and I, I think I mentioned this earlier, is it should be proportionate in all cases. So um, without going into what levels we can and can't sign off at Loughborough, because that is, 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 is quite confidential, obviously. But if, if, for example, you had a £1 million limit that you could sign off on, would you do that for a five k £5,000 project? Um, it would clearly be... be uh, unproportionate and the other thing is we find sometimes where we are doing a certain type of contract so it could be uh, a material transfer agreement or something like that where there isn't actually money changing hands so if we look at restricting it to the value of the project that would be nothing so we generally put a nominal sum in there um, so in that case, we might put a five thousand pound thing, which just focuses both parties on actually doing what they're contracted to do. Whereas if there's no financial penalty, things can be a little bit different and uh, slip a bit, as it were. So I've also put a note there as well within the UK, and I imagine this is the same um, in Serbia as well. So there are some things we just cannot legally exclude from liability. So any activity we do has a risk. Um, if somebody has, a, unfortunately, an accident on a project, then we can't actually limit the damages that that individual might receive and that we might be liable for. Um, so there's legal things that we can't exclude from, a, um, from an agreement. And, those, that is a fairly typical example that I've put there um, for liability. I've also put in a little bit about indemnity. So um, when I moved into a contract role, this took me uh, a little while to get my uh, thought process aligned to. Um, so we see a lot of indemnities in, in the contracts we do, which is if um the other party has costs then we're effectively agreeing to meet all those costs um, and quite often we see these that aren't covered within the overall liability cap so with the, the a liability uh, clause will say subject to clause whichever um, excludes liability for, for, for death, for example, and except for the indemnity. So we quite often see these carved out of that overall liability cap, which effectively means we have unlimited liability, which is, is problematic. So it's, we find it's very, if we see the word indemnity, we, we have to look very closely at what we are indemnifying that partner for whether it's covered by the cap, and then certainly that is something that, that would need escalation um, at Luftwe. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, I've also put in there a very common one is an indemnity for breach of third party intellectual property rights. So when we do an activity, we, we have that much data we can call on, that much IP. Um, and for a project to, to check through those licenses, to check through the source, to check whether it's been used for a different project um, can prove very problematic. So if we see indemnities for the breach of third party IP rights, we, it brings a lot of alarm bells for us um, and that's just something to be aware of. Uh, again, it's not too bad if it's included in the overall liability cap but if it's excluded from that that's something that could actually be a deal breaker for Loughborough um, there unless we have the correct risk assessment in place and there's just a little line about warranties as well we see a lot of these um, again they need to be really limited uh, covered by caps and the final thing I've, I've put in there is Quite often we see contracts, um, grant agreements, um, collaboration agreements where it just doesn't mention a cap on liability. So that effectively means that 
you know, if there was a problem, it would be looked at under law. And generally, law does not apply a cap on liability. So you would, once again, the absence of a limit means it is unlimited uh, there. Next slide, please. So that was a bit of a, a quick session about liability. So after we've considered all these things with a contract at Loughborough, we get to a point where can we sign it or can we not? Um, so it's the approve or decline stage. So next slide, please. So we have an approval process. Um, so similar to what Claire said about the financial approval process, we have one for uh, contract approval. So this effectively ensures that contracts are signed off by the correct signatory. Um, and it also gives myself and my colleagues as much freedom as possible. So we, we have a very detailed um, escalation. So in the case of liability, that could be for the director of finance, whereas if it's a foreign governing law, um, our head of research could consider it. Uh, and we also have the head of legal services as well. So the idea is that we can get these contracts approved, even the problematic ones, by a process to ensure that there's accountability if we're, if we're uh, subject to an audit, we can check the correct approvals have been put in place. And the other thing we've, we find at Loughran and uh, prior to Loughran, I worked at Derby University, we have authorised signatories. So this means that academics can't sign agreements, which we still get them doing, but um, we would then have to revisit it and, and and get it signed by a proper authorised signatory because um, only certain members of staff can, can sign on behalf of the organisation. We do have some carve outs, as I've mentioned previously. So when we get contracts that are frequent, non-negotiable, but still problematic, we have a list of those types of contracts, um, which may be by funder, so for example, all the European Commission's uh, contracts are generally desk agreements. Um, our UK research uh, councils, we approve. There are several other um, funders that we, we can just approve as well. Um, so that's in place to make life easier for us. But if there still remains a problem and we have to escalate it, dependent on where it needs to go, we, we have to kind of do a risk assessment. So we see quite a lot of contracts where there's clauses that would require escalation. So, for example, if we're obliged to comply with US export control legislation, it could be that there is not any chance of that scenario occurring. It's just a blanket clause that that company has in there and that we're actually looking at something totally different that could never be covered by that. So that's where the risk assessment comes in. We, we get in touch with the academic and we ask them what the activity is. Is this likely to occur? Um, and then we can obviously flag it as either problematic for somebody senior to take a decision or it's non-problematic for somebody effectively to understand um, that, that agreement. And the final thing I put there is, is the standard approvals don't cover every eventuality. So um, if there's anything in a contract that causes concern, so we have certain things that need escalation, but some of it's common sense. If we see something and we think, mm, just a moment, then we will generally go to our legal services team to actually get them to have a look in a bit more detail at that, that clause and tell us if there is a problem or not. Okay, so moving on to my final slide. I think whilst contracts is a bit 
possibly not a Friday afternoon um, subject. It's a bit heavy going at times, and that's we've gone through it very quickly. I think the key things for me is that we use a wide range of contracts and contractual tools for any project we do. Some will be simple, some will be very, uh, very different. Um, but the better that contract is drafted, or the better the contract that we receive is drafted, it, it means that the likelihood of any issues down the line is is reduced a lot. So people look at contracts and think, well, you can use this to uh, cause us problems. But actually, it's there as a safeguard as, as well as, as one of the key things. Uh, I put there about the big issue liability, and that always needs to be proportionate. And then flow down terms. Again, they should have been understood by all the parties who are signing up to a collaboration agreement. Uh, and the final two things is I've, I've been looking at contracts for several years now. I still need to take advice quite a lot from either my immediate colleagues or our legal teams. Um, and then, as Claire was saying earlier, we need to be pragmatic when dealing with contracts. So that's all I've got to cover really on contracts. So I'll just open for any questions and then we can we can move on to, to wrap up.